This must be Janine. Hey, this must be Jennifer. Hey. How are you today? I'm good. Thank you. Um, I would first like to get your permission to record our phone conversation. Is that all right? Yes, you're so... Hey, uh, thank you. You're so official. <laughs> but yes, of course. No. All right, Jennifer, I dropped my phone. Are you are you back? Okay. Are you still there? <laughs> yeah, it's easier to drop a phone than a baby. Oh, uh, yes. And unfortunately, I have done both, but I don't <laughs> want to talk about that. <laughs> oh, my God, you're yeah. hilarious. Um, to start. I always seem to set those same kind of things yeah. conversation up. Let's just talk about dropping babies, shall we? Yeah. Um, fortunately, mine are all grown, so they survived me. I know, right? Yes. Hey, I want to, you know, we met at Nevertheless She Preached. Yes. Conference. So I, and I we, have to, like, reboot my brain it's because I was thinking you were someone else and your voice is not at all the, the oh. one that I was thinking of. <laughs> so, yeah, tell me a little bit how we met so I can reboot my memory. I was in your afternoon workshop in the, I think you called it the windowless room of harlots. It was that red. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was so much fun. Oh, and wow. well, that's great. Uh, yeah, and we were just looking for the pole in the. <laughs> I know, right? In there, and uh, so it was tons of fun. And now I know your story and your background, but some of our readers might not. Cool. Can you give me the cliff notes about that, Jennifer? Uh, cliff notes, yeah, kind of like uh, a like a, like I don't know how far back you want to go into, but not necessarily raised in like uh, like most, the way most evangelicals kind of describe being raised in the church. Right. Yeah. Didn't have that experience at all. Um, typical Midwestern, Midwesterner, however, like you know, kind of where everybody goes to church, but. Um, I think my family is more along the lines of mainliners until I got very serious about my faith when I got into college, yep. um, which led into me doing faith-based music, definitely got more in touch with the evangelical community, um, would have described my, um, you know, my, conver I, I guess, I, you know, t typically you would have, most people describe what would happen as a, a conversion and evangelical experience. So yes. um, I usually say that I definitely drank the Kool-Aid, um, <laughs> but you know, I, I don't think that, you know, at one hand, like that's me trying to balance out like the, my resistance to that I have today of this idea of this dramatic conversion versus yes. a revelation. And the same time, tr you know, like I realized that in saying that it kind of weakens I don't really want to weaken the the paradigm shift and the dramatic effect that that revelation had in my life. Right. Um, so part of you know I think part of one of the fun things now is trying to really dive into that kind of concept. You know, and, and it's really strange trying to find that in some parts you're like it's a resistance to language at the same time trying to preserve and elevate the experience without having it cheapened by the language. Yes. Um, so, and, you know, and kind of like pulling, and so I, I just to kind of help you maybe craft a timeline that's a little bit more brief for your thing. So the college thing, you know, led me into to really contemplating what this faith meant, um, experienced that a lot through writing Christian music, touring a lot through that, um, getting disillusioned by uh, the evangelical experience for certain uh, left that for about seven years, came back, uh, shook off the cloak of doing specifically Christian music, yes. came out as gay, which obviously is a point that people like to talk about. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and that experience, you know, obviously shaped um, my religious experience too. Sure. Um, I really had to contemplate, you know, and ask some hard questions. What do I really believe? What do I really want to look like? And what do the, the context of who I am relate to my faith? Especially, yeah. you know, what's changeable, what's not changeable, what is my reality? 
Um, and so like long story short, you know, I've, I kind of went through, I've gone through various stages of, of anger and rage and disappointment yeah. and still somehow maintaining some kind of connection to my spiritual experience. And I, and I think which is part of the miracle of a spiritual experience, right? That you're able to live the reality of your life and who you are and still maintain that connection with something bigger than yourself. Yeah, I mean, I, I think with as much frustration I've had, you know, about, say, the language of that, yeah. that that conversion experience, something significant did dramatically shift in my life. And trying to make sense of that in a way that didn't um, throw the baby out with a bathwater yeah. has taught me a lot of things about what that experience was, how serious I actually am about that, and how much for lack of a better way, it stuck. I mean, it wasn't just a transitory experience. I didn't, as it turns out, just drink some Kool-Aid. Right. I mean, there was something transformative about that experience and trying to find a way to articulate that in the maelstrom of um, uh, tradition and religious experiences that sometimes try to color this when we're not like towing the party line or we don't yeah. look like the way that we've narrated that that gives people a lot to contemplate. And for me, I didn't just accept what everybody said about me um, because somewhere here I knew that there was something um, significantly different and transformed in my life and trying to find a new way to talk about that. Um, when, you know, I, and I think that's kind of the experience of a lot of LGBTQ people is that um, we just haven't given up on trying to find a language that we haven't been allowed to use. Yeah. Um, for for decades upon decades, and you know, having a heterosexual narrative kind of played out for us, we just are are really struck not struggling, but really laboring in a, a positive way to find the the language that that shows why it's not that we're making a seat at the table for ourselves. We haven't left. Just reminding people that we have as right, you know, that that we're sitting there and dining and supping with everybody else. It is the community and fellowship that that we haven't lost, but you know, sometimes family isn't necessarily, you know, sometimes relationships are hard in family. You yeah. know, you don't get along with everybody and trying to find a perspective of, of, the, of the strange people in your family is something <laughs> to do. So, and it works both ways, right? Right. So that's, that's, that's about a short version as I can give you. So <laughs> feel free to kind of narrate that, you know, how it makes sense to the, what you already know. Well, um, and, and what you said about your background uh, I read your book, by the way, and absolutely loved it. And I'd love to talk about that in just a little bit. But what you talk about leads us in to the main, um, the main point of the interview that I wanted to talk about your workshop at Nevertheless She Preached 2018 yeah. conference. It was called Bouncing Back from the Fall, Reclaiming Our Created Human Worth. Yeah. So you talked about being in the image of God. Yeah. And that that gives us inherent worth. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I guess we can kind of start with the problem. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, and well, I'll, I'll start with like my experience, which the same thing I did in the workshop. There are two things that I learned from my experience, right. And that they're, you know, in this, in my kind of narrative, I first kind of experienced that as a woman in a church. Yeah. Um, and the way that uh, my 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 role as a woman inside of the church was often colored from the way that I'd heard about my necessity for salvation, right. particularly as it related to Genesis. You know, like a woman was, it's kind of our fault for the fall. Um, we're inherently kind of, you know, cor right. have this amazing ability apparently to be corruptible to all humanity yeah. but it's it's not just us i mean you know this this the fall is kind of where we always go back to why do we need jesus and the answer for that is well humans are bad um and i know i know that i know that like that's not necessarily what what we teach but you know we kind of like say one thing and do another and it gets really confusing for a lot of people right um and the challenge in that when we talk about how this you know, how basically how human beings are just kind of this thing that absolutely needs saving without a shadow of a doubt. Get from the minute we're born. 
Yeah, for, that we're bad from birth. Right. And that, that we don't have a lot of say in the matter, even though we've got this weird thing like free will happening out there. So the, the purpose kind of out of this and out of my experiences were kind of resisting these ideas. And partic- this particularly came to head as, as a gay person is that there's something made about me that's wrong and that I'm supposed to resist this kind of way that I was created. And um, I just, I found that really contradictory at times to, to a couple of things. One, just in, in imagining what our creation narrative tells us that we are created in the image of God and that it's, you know, somewhere in there, cause we say it in Southerners love to say, God don't make no junk. You know, <laughs> there's something in there that we don't let go of. We know that we're good things, but I think sometimes there's this resistance to claim that goodness from birth to claim that we are, we have, you know, we're not necessarily to say for me to say that I'm bad, not bad from birth and that I am not bad and I'm a beautiful, wonderful, amazing creation seems like it lacks this humility and threatens this idea of salvation. But, you know, that's a little bit, that gets a step a little bit further down the road but going, there's a distinction to be made between that we have a bad nature and we have ability to make, or that we have ability to make poor choices. I think yeah. that does, I think it's destructive. Um, and I think it's proven destructive if you keep telling a human being that they're bad and that they'll never amount to anything and that they can't do things on their own. It takes the responsibility away from us to make our own decisions. It takes uh, our sense of our dignity away from us, that we're in control of our actions and our behaviors, and that our potential is wide open for the good um so that's that's kind of one of the like the, the real st- stepping point of being able to say no it's we have potential and i'm going to stand up and claim that potential like i want to know what that is and i right. want to know my value and my worth i think that's a wildly different thing and i, I did you know i think it's littered in in our experiences like i don't think that we're necessarily ignoring that or that's not something that we teach which is kind of one of the ways that when I sit in a room, I'm, I'm a little bit nervous because I realize that sometimes we say one thing and do another. Mm-hmm. The, the idea that we have potential and that we can do good is obviously permeated throughout all of our traditions. Um, we're pushing ourselves to, to live up and into our potential. The, the challenge is like, re, you know, kind of going back to that narrative and understanding what the implications of that are when we begin to, to like, it's not that bad to say, listen, I'm not bad. Yeah. It's not that I need salvation because I was born bad from birth. Um, that really freaks a lot of people out because yeah. they'll say, no, I have potential. I've made bad decisions. And when I say that, then all of a sudden the, 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 the lens is different. I realize I'm responsible for my decisions. When I realize that in my sin, I not only damaged myself, which could have, been okay you know like that I'm eroding something by my bad decisions but I'm also eroding bad bad decisions you know with those decisions um eroding you know the hope and the potential of other people as well um that makes me you know going back and looking at human beings as a good thing to want to be able to treat with dignity and kindness and as if they're precious creations of God um that to me is I mean I know that we already do that but it's like to me is highlighting, you know, what do we really want to highlight here? And right. that's one of my pushes was like pushing always and onward into the dignity of human beings. Um, and, and again, like as an LGBTQ person, that's probably one of the narratives that's been, that's probably one of the most experiences that's been so influential because oftentimes you'd be like, listen, you know, maybe you were born gay, you know, maybe it's not just the choice. Now you have a choice to not make that choice. Um, because maybe God made you a little bit differently than somebody else. And we're not saying God made a mistake. <laughs> yeah. We're just saying that you're the one making a mistake because you gave into the, this abnormality that you have. And I think that's just really contradictory. And well, so we have and to it look plays at the ways that we have dignity. Um, what you said about the LGBTQ community, it plays right into born bad. Because yeah. if you are born gay, then that is yet another badness for you to overcome. Well, I think it shifts the blame. What concerns me is that we shift the blame into, like if we were in theology, we'd go into, we'd shift the blame and the the focus onto our anthropology, you know, our anthropology. Who are we and what kind of, what kind of a human is a good human? Um, Rather than, 
like making the distinction, you know, if we, we stop and we say, listen, humans are good things. Yeah. They're created good. And it's a, it's a part of creation. Now move on to the next part about, it's a different conversation alone to talk about what sin is, like what our behavior right. is, what we do with those behaviors and, and what we're designed to do as human beings. Let's, it's kind of shifting that thought. And I think there, for me personally, theologically, um, particularly the w- with the way that I would describe humans as a good creation, um, born into all of our potential and options, what we do with those options matters. And that, you know, for me, theologically, that's where our free will comes into play and our ability to, to engage with God with our choice. Um, you know, we're not just, I think we do know, and I don't think I've heard too many people that, you know, even throughout history, theologically, we've never really gone very far with thinking that humans don't have free will or that, you know, we're somehow our lives are scripted before us. Like we realize and understand somewhere here, we have a part to play. Right. How do we play a part with, and that's my question, like how with, um, you know, lifting up the, the idea that we have potential that we have within us an ability to do and play just as God plays in the world in a way that's positive and amazing and regenerative in the world rather than destructive in the world. Yeah. And you take, you know, I, that's, it's, I mean, I just, I think it's a, a, like, to me, it's a red herring to even my own sense of responsibility to myself. Like, Oh, it's not my fault. Like I was just, right. I was made bad versus no, it is my fault. Like I do have responsibility here. I am aware of what's going on and I'm willing to put in the time and the effort to do something about it. Yeah. Um, you talked about the damaging belief that we're born bad. And in the workshop, you you made a distinction between doing something wrong and being wrong. Yeah, absolutely. So that's yeah. the difference between guilt and, and shame. And <laughs> yeah, that's the difference between guilt and shame. And you said that guilt can sometimes be a good thing because it causes you to reevaluate what you're doing. But shame over who you are is never a good thing. It insults our very being. Oh my gosh, exactly. I'm glad you quoted me and understood that really well. <laughs> I, got, I don't have anything to add to that except for, yeah, absolutely. You got me right. <laughs> <laughs> so you said that part of the image of God is God's redemptive nature. Tell me a little bit about that. God's redemptive nature. I'm... Um, I'm not quite sure. Do you have more on that? Uh, Yeah, you said that God has come to get you to rescue a valuable human from a broken and corrupt system. So it's not what I got from that was it's not that God thought you were so horrible that he had to rescue you. It's that God thought you were so valuable that he wanted to come get you. Um. Yeah, you know, to, uh, today, I think, I, like, here's what I would do if I were to tweak that a little bit, um, because I I think sometimes we, we do think we're getting rescued, and I don't necessarily want to disagree. I think sometimes I definitely get rescued. Yeah. Um, at the other time, though, I think it's, like, one of the, one of the things when we talk about the fall, it, like, if if I take away this idea that I'm bad from birth, then it does raise the question, then why do we need Christ, right? right? What then is salvation and what is God telling us by Jesus being in the world? What is the need for us to, to be in some way, how whatever the language is, relieved of our sin, right. our sins atoned for? Like, how do we deal with the fact that we do sin when this is incompatible in some way or, in, you know, somehow puts... Uh, a wedge between us and God. Right. Um, there's something that happens there that's that's significant, and I don't want to make light of it. So what I would say is that uh, you know part of that coming into the world is that I, I see Jesus as a revelation. I mean, Jesus as um, this not that that what Jesus communicates to us. Like, what do we see when we see Jesus in the world? And we see Jesus, you know, participating with human beings. I mean, there's like no of the like the woman at the well right? right the woman of the well like her past isn't erased magically it still exists and there's a hope and the belief that hopefully that the, the sins of the past won't re- be repeated in the future but nothing really overwhelmingly like magical or supernatural happens in that moment yeah it's just 
the care and concern of God saying, see your worth, see your worth. This is the damage that it does. Turn from that, turn into this <clears throat> other way and, and come with. Right. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's sometimes like when, like, when we're talking about like this idea of dignity and pushing against this idea that we're somehow being delivered up and plucked out and transformed in some way, <clears throat> I don't want to like, I, I, it's, it's part of me being able to say, listen, like when I now, like what Jesus does is it gives, when I say revelation is now gives me an understanding about the cost of that. When I begin to see my dignity and I begin to see the cost of that, when I make poor choices, when this, me as a good creation does a bad thing, um, it's I, I see the damage that I'm causing and I see the potential of something else. I mean, in Christ, we see the potential of God's goodness um, and, and our being with and the encouragement to do that. So. You know, I'm a little bit, I'm not communicating that very well. I'm disappointed with my talking right well, now. Well, no, yeah. no. Um, you're, you brought up the woman at the well, and um, Caroline Lewis was in that workshop. Yeah. And she talked about salvation as liberation. Yeah, it absolutely is. Like, I don't, I am not, I mean, that's what I think one of the things that Christ reveals to us is that we're not slaves to the worst of our own nature. Yeah. Like, and I think that that's to me part of the distinction between, you know, trying to double down on how bad we are. Like, no, stop looking at how bad we are. Look right. At how good we have the potential to be. Yes, you muck up. You know, yes, we make mistakes. You know, you're human. You're not God. Right. Get over it. Yep. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and that's kind of, you know, I think that's kind of the, the humil the humbling part of that. But that's the fear, I think, sometimes that people hear when I stick my head up too high and I stand up too yeah. high and go, no, I'm, I'm not going to be torn down by this. Like I, yes, those are my sins. Yes. Those are my mistakes. Those are not my mistakes. These are, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I think it's really important as an alternative to understanding what it is we are, you know, what Christ is and what, um, what salvation is through Christ. It's really important to, to see God or to see Jesus, not just as like some blood on the altar of covering up our sins yeah. as if, you know, and it's, it's, I mean, it's a complicated thing because I, I know that there's a, a, a strong theological push for sacri sacrificial atonement, but there, there are two pay, there are two parts where I'm personally kind of challenging, challenging to see Jesus theologically in terms of atonement. What does it mean to have my sins forgiven in a new way that's different than just, I'm so bad something yep. had to die, you know, a, a part of God had to be brutally murdered um, in human flesh to show what I deserve. And I, I'm very uncomfortable with that narrative, particularly as a woman. Yep, me and, too. And even more so as an LGBTQ per person, like Matthew Shepard's, it's the 20th anniversary uh, of Matthew Shepard this year. Uh, you know, the idea that you can just beat or stone to death somebody yeah. who's committed evil is not the way that we release killing killing is not a way to to me to atone for sin right like it's it's potential to be able to to have made that sin and do something redemptive after that sin um so when we talk about that atonement then looking at I, I'm, you know, I'm suggesting that what I want to put on the table of what Christ means is seen as a revelation of my potential, that atonement is being able to see the possibility of my liberation and know that I'm able to move forward. Um, and the second part of that is, is being able to see that Jesus is a partner in that experience as a human being, that when we look at Christ's suffering, we see that, that God wasn't afraid of our suffering, wasn't necessarily trying to say that all humans um, were going to be able to necessarily avoid that, yeah. but that there's still hope after that. I mean, Jesus at the end of that is resurrected and there isn't a death for Jesus in that eternal sense. And that's, that to me is, is one of the things that I want to explore and I, I think is important to explore in light of what we know about the experiences that we've had. Um, and I'm no theological giant, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to make any bones about kind of wanting to rewrite the script. I think all of these things are there with different theologians that we've had. 
we're just trying to understand salvation in a different way from a perspective that just just doesn't start with us in a state of annihilation right um but giving us hope in the future and what when we, we when we begin to look at the cross and we begin to talk about that then we have to start looking at the cross in other ways and just trying to pull humanity from a destructed, annihilated yeah. state and get a sense of agency back into our own participation. Oh, that is so good. That is so good. Get a sense <laughs> of agency in our participation. And it circles back around to what you said about free will and making choices and realizing the dignity of that. Yeah, it really does. Uh, you know, and I, choice is a funny, funny word, especially when you talk about queer people. Like we'd love to be able to talk about that on on, on that perspective. But uh, you know, it's it, to me like like one of one of the do- domains like like that's particular to me is it, when we talk about the fall. Oftentimes, we get into this zone of human beings. Like, what's the worst thing human beings do? Like, we're 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 dirty nasty sexy things <laughs> like yeah you know it's it's so when we talk about the potential of of our you know the potential of our agency to do good things it's like we throw human body and flesh under the bus as if we can't do good things with our bodies yeah. the idea that sex only passes on sin rather than sex being able to procreate our more humans like more created humans yeah. that are amazing and wonderful and glorious and so sex gets this bad rap you know the desire of women gets the bad rap in the fall the desire of women is being you know like our desire is full stop getting yeah. bad rap rather than you know saying what of my desire is good what is the best potential for my desire rather than being afraid of that um being able to find ways to look at that um in light of the decisions that we can make with that, like if I am going to have sex and whoever I have sex with, how do I have sex with those people in an ethic that's reflective of the God I know that's created me with goodness and greatness and you with goodness and greatness? Right. Like, what does that mean? And I, I, you know, these are the kinds of the kind of reframing of these questions that I think feminism gives us the opportunity to engage. Yeah. Um, that you know as lgbtq people give us uh, an opportunity to engage um these are just two you know my personal zones that i i call into my own theology um at the same time you know sometimes i feel like i'm totally cracking it because i know i'm saying things differently than what i was taught but at the same time i would say that you know i see in my church the way that we we speak one way we actually teach not too far away or we actually live out not too far away from this um, we're just, I think we get sometimes tired. We get like wrapped up in the same language and we go, Oh, Jesus died for our sins. <laughs> yeah. You know, and then we, you know, we keep drawing parallels to, to a sacrifice of, you know, on the altar and shedding blood for that. And for us to really look at that and going, is this really what we mean in salvation? Right. You know, um, are there other ways that, that we can see a redemptive quality, not only in God's potential, but ours with our other human beings i mean we know for a fact that we don't just kill people who sin (laughs) yeah and our communities we give them opportunities and we make a way and grace comes into the picture and sometimes even on behalf of our our you know some our neighbor we'll we take the hit of their sin against us and don't punish it to the maximum because we offer a gateway into the in hope um so these, I mean, these are all kind of like wrapped up into this kind of conversation um, that I'm, I'm particularly proud of when I see our community kind of really struggling with that, not yeah. just saying, no, the sinner deserves to be punished. The sinner deserves to be kicked out of the, the congregation, you know, that kind of payment. But how do we take sin seriously? How do we take our failing seriously? And how to, at the same time in taking that seriously, how do we do our maximum most boast? to be in line with the the hope and the potential potential and the redemption and the grace and the mercy that that Christ modeled for us. I think that's our real challenge here. Yeah, I do too. And you mentioned um as you're exploring your theology that you are in divinity school. I uh, finished up. I don't know you if I did? Yeah, I Oh, congratulations. Today. 
yeah, I finished up in May, which was really good. And, uh, yeah, so kind of, I'm just now kind of recovering after the summer and yeah. now I'm full blown <laughs> into the tour and stuff. Yeah. So it's, it's been a little bit nice to, um, yeah, like actually get, let the dust settle a little bit. Cause it's pretty yeah. much a mad rush. You're learning, learning and practicing and practicing. And then it's kind of fun as the dust settles a little bit, you start to remember the things, um, that really stick in your craw. I mean, the, the questions that are raised. Um, when you read other people dealing with their experiences and other theologians who have um, kind of thought about these things, I, like one of the things I loved about divinity school, it, it never occurred to me that people had been, you know, that our theologians throughout history have, have been trying to, to figure out what the riddle is, <laughs> yeah. you know, what is salvation, uh, particularly post-war, post-Europe, 1940s, you know, yeah. there was a real push against this idea that death and sacrifice were the ways that we should look at salvation. The consequences of human death were, were so great at that time that theologians were going, really, we might need to look at this a different way. Yeah. You know, maybe we as humans are not totally right to think that killing everything that moves um, yeah. contrary to what we think it should, you know, deserves to be bludgeoned to death. Um, you know, how do we find mercy and peace in our land, knowing that the world really does have evil in it? Who do we want to be in light of that? And how do we decide to be that? No, you know, who are we then? Who are we as yeah. human beings? It's one of the first places to start. Um, but yeah, I, I love being able to read theologians. <laughs> it gave me permission to, to not necessarily, gave me permission to put my experience on the table to put, you know, the timeliness of our, not just mine, but, you know, our social experience on the table, like put women and the women that I know and the people that I love and the other, you know, queer folks that, you know, put our experiences into this conversation and say, we, there's something about salvation that we want to be able to see. It's not trying to, to tear apart the throat, you know, tear apart orthodoxy. It's trying to, to redeem not even redeem it's trying to engage and take it seriously like yeah. I, I i take seriously the idea of it of atonement um but i also realize that you know when i start talking about well i'm not bad from birth then what does atonement mean what does the salvation mean and so I'm just kind of pushing against that all the time looking for something that's honest with the gospel um rather than just repeating the old, line, old lines when we're saying, okay, wait, I'm, I'm being crushed by the theology that, yeah. and the language that we have. What, what allows me to move forward toward that? Because it does, like, like Caroline was saying, like um, moving forward that we're, we're throwing off chains not to be liberated to do what we want, but to be liberated to know, you know, into our potential, right. um, to be the created beings that we are, to have joy, to have grace, and to act. And, and feel the goodness of our creation through God is, uh, um, and when we're, and be brutal when our theology, <laughs> I, you know, yeah. I, like, I don't have a problem being brutal. Like if I've done ill and it, it's caused me negatively because I'm like the things that, you know, I, I love the verse, you know, he has been forgiven much love. Much. Yeah. When you see a revelation of how much better something can be when you do it in a new way, <laughs> like uh -huh. I'm never going to go back to the old way. Like, right. It's just like, if it works, it works. And if it's freed and liberating, you do it, you repeat it. And then sometimes you forget and you get bad on your yeah. skills and you have to, <laughs> you know, go back and do some practice and you're like, Oh, Oh yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned in your book, um, the, I think the phrase was, tyranny of the theology that you had been taught yeah it's, it's oh my gosh i can't believe how much you pay attention you're freaking me out um yeah i mean it's that concept right like it's i want to do good you know my parents tell me to do something some way and i believe them and it works and it works and it works but what happens when i'm left-handed i'm not right-handed yeah you know like it's not saying that I'm not going to learn to write and I'm not going to learn to write well, but I may need to do that in a different way. So sometimes, you know, getting a perspective on the different kinds of experience, it's not saying that, you know, there isn't truth in God's word or that, that orthodoxy isn't useful to us. But when our theologies are breaking us down and we're just holding on to, uh, you know, a rule without understanding what we're doing, you're, we're not actually following the rule. We don't know it. You right. Know? Um, it's just it's so bizarre to me because I can repeat a behavior just because you tell me but it doesn't mean that I know what I'm doing or that I intend to do what I'm doing with the consequence and the peace and the goodwill that it's engendered to do like 
you know, I can be nice to you, but it doesn't mean that I love you. Like I I can do all these things, but what does it mean when I love you? Like, what will I do then? And how does that change the game? And those things are significant, significant. So the tyranny of theology is kind of about a lot of that kind of way of thinking, um, you know, finding ways to know who we are created to be, know how, you know, what our options are in this world and to release the joy of that. I mean, it's it's very difficult for me to believe that we're just here to kind of mechanically act out principles, right? Um, but rather to be able to engage. And I, I, I think the gospel speaks to that every day of the week. I mean, Jesus wasn't just, you know, exactly religion. Jesus, Jesus was overwhelmingly social, overwhelmingly engaged. Yeah. Um, and overwhelmingly fruitful in his relationships. And that to me is the joy of living. So I want to figure out what does this mean um, in my day-to-day thing? I don't, I don't just want to know theology just so I can know something and and look clever. I want to, I want to know how to work and love better in the world while I get to be here. And that has to do with your theology. One of the things you said in the workshop was what I understand about God will show up in my practices. Yeah, and what I don't understand God or what I misunderstand God also shows up. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like you know, if I've got a whacked out, you know, if I've got something whacked out, it, it shows up. Like the fruit yeah. of it is not as good as I imagined it would be, or as damaging. And being honest about where that's at. I mean, I just, I don't know. Like for me, for me personally, I just, I, I, I love, I, I just, I don't know. I, I just deeply. Well, one of the things about like coming out, like that was such an amazing thing or like understanding my own sexual orientation at some point was such a kind of an aha moment for me going, oh, my God, I am this. I don't know what this is. Like, I don't really wholly know how to explain it or mechanically how it works or, you know, I like, know more than I know that I'm a woman. I get up in the morning. I don't know. I look down. I have the body that I have. Yeah. The thoughts in my head are the thoughts that I have. And the rest of society calls it woman. <laughs> I mean, OK. Yeah. I, I am that. And so with that, and I'm not in a big hurry. I don't even want to change it. Like I like it. Like I'm pretty comfortable in this. So yeah. what do I do with that? Like, this is, this is the, the body that I get and the life as I get, all I want to do is be the best version of that. And when I'm not, which feels like probably 80% of the time, I'm not living up to my potential, <laughs> uh, you know, like sort of like, you know, like what we say, we only use what 10% of our brain. Yeah. Like, I feel like I only use about 10% of my life. Yep. And and it's it's not a critique that I'm being wasteful that I'm not using 90%. I need to build, what I want to do is build up the muscles to be able to do more. And because the 10% I've got is fucking extraordinary. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> life is amazing. And so you mean, you mean to tell me I could have more, you yeah. know, that I could, that I could love more and that I could teach. So other people, we could do it together and learn together. Yeah. I mean, these are the joys of our life. And I think sometimes the tyranny of theology just keeps telling us that reminding us of, you know, how much we're failing compared to the rest of our potential rather than yeah. anticipating the best of that. Than looking at the potential that we have. One of the things you said in your book was I was eager to move beyond the Christian idea of, of flawed humanity and get on with living my life to the full. That's exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. And I, you know, I, gosh, I wrote that book like four or five years ago. <laughs> I love it so much. I adored it. But here's the fun thing. Like now I get, now, now I've got a little bit more muscle to talk about like, like what is that thing that was in my heart? And now like understanding that thing in my heart and what the consequences are to that when I engage that with theology, like who is God? And yes, maybe I think that, and does that match out? You know, I'm four or five years down the track, and right. does that idea match out with the theolo- the potential when I talk about this theologically? And I feel like it does. You know, I feel like in the last 20 years, that's shown up in my music, and I've always been personally pressing toward that. I always thought that that was just something that I might be making up or just being a rebel against my own tradition. Going like, why am I? under this burden and now I look at theology I'm like no yeah (laughs) like theology is telling me that you know that is right like I do have potential I am extraordinary um and so you know like it's a confirmation of that and I'm after spending you know 20 years willing to to believe that I was not worth that yeah (laughs) you know it's um you know just testing that out so I don't know like I'm I'm grateful that 
I could say that, you know, four or five years ago, not understand how to describe that theologically, just the added nerd bonus of being <laughs> able to, to talk about that and get into that more deeply when sometimes our church literally goes out on the limb to write it down that that's not true. Yeah. Yeah. And that's frustrating. And um, your book, what you're saying just now goes back to one of the themes that I noticed in your book was that of journey and an adventure, um, both in your personal life and in your faith. And that's what you just talked about. You, you learn better language. You learn more about who God is. You learn more about your capacity for the potential that God created. I think it, I like when you say learn, because it makes me think about the ways that humans learn. I mean, I can sit down and read a book, like, I don't know, car mechanic. Yeah. Make, you know, pick one. I can read a book and know everything about it, but there's something wholly different about doing that same work with my hands. Right. Like, there's book smarts and then there's life smart, like street smarts, right? Right. And I, I think the same holds in our faith. I think sometimes we give experience a short rap and realizing that's how we learn. But life is a journey. I'm not going to learn it unless I have the experience to do it. I'm not going to, like, practice makes perfect. To get out there and do it again and again and again um, is the hope. Um, you know, and I just, I don't know how to shut that down. Like, I will never sin if I live in a box. And even then, that tells, you know, we're told that, no, you will. Yeah. <laughs> you live in a box. <laughs> even by yourself, you're sin by yourself. And I'm like, yeah, you're probably right, I will. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> But, you know, we're not, if we're shutting the system down, then we're not living our life. Like, we were living beings. We're yeah. we're supposed to be out, and we're supposed to be moving. And my fear has, and because I've seen, my fear is, like, in, in, in empathy and in partnership with so many people have seen that under the tyranny of this kind of thinking, yeah. that they've shut down their lives. They've been afraid to move. They've been afraid to make a mistake. They've been on their knees more than they've been on their feet. Yeah. And the point is to get on our feet and not be afraid of the punishment of God. Um, but to yeah. feel oh, God's that's cooperation so with good. Us. Oh, that's so good. Um, one of my pastor friends in Texas says, most decisions that we make in life are not right or wrong. They're right or left. We're waiting on God. We're waiting on God to tell us what to do, and God's waiting on us to make a move. Yeah, and uh, I mean, the funny thing is, like, here, here's the funny thing about uh, what I'm, I've learned in recent years about theology is that we we teach a lot of things and we say a lot of things or we re repeat a lot of things that are actually different than what we do, and it's not necessarily hypocrisy. It's just we get in the the habit, it sounded poetic, it seems to describe yeah. what we do, and it sounds really good, so we keep repeating and repeating, and it gets kind of funneled down, but the nuances are lost, yeah. and we kind of do different things, and I say that I'm a saved person, and now everybody in America thinks that I'm a Jesus freak, rather than understanding, like, the whole history of my life and liberation, the right. paradigm shift, and how much I've discovered about love, and I don't care if I do that inside or outside of the church, and I'm not doing that love, so other people, you know, be part of my club. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, so I, so because that lent, you know, so I'm resisting that language in many ways, but I'm, I'm seeking to find the language that expresses something more because at the end of the day, I don't think what we do changes who God is. Yeah. It's <laughs> right. But what we say about it changes how people view God. Right. And that's the challenge in front of every one of us who has the opportunity to talk about that. Um, and I put way more faith, strangely enough, in what I do than what I say. <laughs> yeah. I think that's true. Uh, um, I don't want to be tested on either side of it, really. Yeah, me either. <laughs> <laughs> because like I said, I'm a 10% kind of gal. <laughs> yeah. Um, tell, us, tell us about your foundation, Inside Out Faith. Yeah, Inside Out Faith. So it is my engagement with faith communities um, and LGBTQ. LGBTQ um, affirmation, support, um, inside a faith community, inclusion. Uh, so yeah, I go out and I engage faith community, which 
you know, if you had told me 10 years ago when I was coming back um, to public life, I, I really anticipated and was really excited about never working with the church again. Yeah. Um, but uh, strangely enough, like just the conversation about sexual orientation and and how much a positive role my faith has made in that has led me to re-engage. Um, so yeah, I get to go out and speak, advocate for LGBTQ people, you know, speak, do some conversations about why it's important, but mostly, um, it's just an effort to show that LGBTQ people exist, have been vibrant, have been here all along and help people tell their stories. So I love that. How can our readers learn more? Uh, yeah, insideoutfaith.org. Jenniferknapp.com is the porthole for I uh, porthole. Whenever I say <laughs> hole, it just sounds bad. The portal for all things Jen Knapp. Um, <laughs> okay, that room, this has nothing to do with anything, and it won't be in my article. But when I was my my kids grew up and I got a divorce. And anyway, we can talk about my story later, but I went back to college and I went to Bible college. And, um, one of my friends called me one, t one day and said, would you like to come over? We're going to grill out and play cornhole. <laughs> and I said, I don't know what kind of person you think I am, but I am a Christian Bible college student, and I am a single woman, and I will not be playing cornhole with any of y'all nasty people. She <laughs> was dying laughing. I had never heard of it. I know, right? It's had never, never heard, heard of it. And she told everybody <laughs> my lack of knowledge of all things cornhole. So I'm with you on the, on the whole thing. Yeah. I'm like, yep. Hold yep. <laughs> Hard word these days. Man. Add corn to it. It's not good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was not having any of that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Gosh. Anyway, Jennifer, I am absolutely thrilled. I am such a fan. I was just fangirling out. I was at the, I was at your concert on Sunday night before the conference um, I was thrilled that I was able to be in your workshop. I adore your music, and you're on tour, right? I am. Well, I'm on tour, so that'd be worth mentioning. We're going to be in Texas. I don't know when you're publishing or printing or whatever. It's probably going to be. It's probably going to be about three weeks, according to my editor. Yeah, let me look at my schedule to see if that lines up. Sorry, I just had to get some food in my mouth. That's all right. Um, uh, I, no, can look, I can look that up. I can look that up, and um, we can put a link to your tour schedule. Yeah, I'm, I'm in Texas next week, and um, Austin and Dallas. Oh, I love and Austin and Dallas. Yeah, so anyway. But, yeah, we're on tour. Like, I'm sure you have more readers than just in the South, so. I yeah. uh, love it. It has been such a pleasure to speak to you. I appreciate your taking this time. I know you're on the tour and you're busy and I really appreciate taking the time. I'm looking forward to having our readers hear from you in this way. And um, I know it's been a few years since you wrote it, but would you mind if I published a book review on Facing the Music on our website? No, not at all. And um, just for fun, because... <laughs> Um, you could link to like whoever's selling it, like Amazon or whatever. Yeah. And uh, there's an audio book out as well. So. Oh, great. Yeah. Did you read it? Did you do the audio book? Yeah, I did. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's going to be fabulous. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Well, Jennifer, I can't thank you enough. And I am thrilled with the work you're doing. You're doing holy work. You're out there loving God and loving people. And I appreciate that there are women like you who speak for women like me. Why? Well, thank you very much. And I, I'm, I'm, you give me hope that I'm actually being coherent. Um, Absolutely. You are. That was, that was wonderful. All right. Well, I appreciate it, Janine. You have a good day and, and thanks for your support. Thanks, Jennifer. Bye-bye. Right, cheers. Bye.